What do embedded engineers consider when trying to protect their products? Find out with me, Todd Baker, as I speak to field application engineers at Littlefuse about ESD protection and the reliability of our designs in even unexpected conditions. Electrostatic discharge is something that we as electrical engineers are always thinking about when we're designing our systems. It's in the back of our mind. It's something that, that as we look at the system itself, we're adding circuitry to protect the, the, the communication ports, to protect our power supplies, and ensure that the end user of our system has a good, reliable experience. But I think a lot of us come out of college and in our early design careers, particularly with an academic knowledge of what ESD is um, and, and how to, to protect against that. But some of the details of ESD are something that we don't always have a lot of knowledge about. Today, I've got the privilege of speaking with Mark Hubbard of Little Fuse, uh, and he's an expert in ESD design and, and wanted to take some time to kind of pick Mark's brain a little bit, gain some expertise on ESD and some of the details on what engineers should be considering when it comes to ESD protection in their design. So Mark, thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks, Todd. It's great to be here. I appreciate you having me on. Great, great. So uh, let's start with just the very basics. And this is probably a little bit of a silly question between two electrical engineers, but let's just start with the question of what exactly is ESD um, and, and what exactly should engineers be thinking about and why is it so critical to be considering ESD early on in your design? Yeah, that's a great question. And ESD is, is a result of a phenomenon referred to as triboelectric charge. And basically what that is, is when two dissimilar materials come in contact with each other, there's a transfer of charge from one to the other. And the level or severity of the charge can be due to several different environmental factors. This could be the type of materials, the speed of separation, the surface area of contact, and one of the main ones is the relative humidity of the environment. Now, ESD in general is actually a very fast transient. I mean, you know, it's, it's rise time is about one nanosecond and the overall duration is about 100 nanoseconds. So in reality, it's really very low energy, but it can be very high voltage in the tens of thousands of volts. And when this gets conducted into a piece of equipment, this can wreak havoc anywhere from soft failures to latch ups to latent failures that may not even appear for some time or hard component failures. And this all leads to warranty returns and overall customer dissatisfaction. Yeah, and I think as electrical engineers, we've all had that sinking feeling in our chest as we've touched a board on the workbench, uh, felt a shock and realized the board's not powered. It was us powering the board and probably blowing a component, or maybe that's just me. I know I've had that experience. I, I think they kept me off the production floor because uh, I, I wasn't always great about wearing my, my proper shoes and, and wrist straps. Uh, so always a consideration for us. Are, are there any standards or models that engineers need to be considering when, when they're looking at ESD in their systems? What Are, are there areas where um, different areas that certify that? Yeah, there's, there's actually several standards that are used to simulate ESD events, and they're kind of based on what environment you might be in as to what standard might be most applicable. So an example, a pretty common one that a lot of engineers are probably aware of is the human body model. And the human body model is basically to um, simulate the manufacturing environment. So suppliers that are supplying the chipsets, whether these are the USB drivers or the Phi chips and things like that, this is the standard that they pretty much base their on-chip or on-board protection for. And this uses a 100 picofarad charge capacitor and a 1500 ohm discharge resistor, and I'll, I'll talk about why that's important in a moment. Um, and then they, the test levels are up to about 2 kV. And the whole purpose of that standard is really just to make sure that their chipsets are making it through the manufacturing environment and they're getting good yields coming off the line. Now, the interesting thing is, is that as nomenclatures or architectures have gotten smaller, the cost of trying to keep that same, say, 2 kV level of ESD on a chipset is beginning to increase exponentially. But what a lot of these suppliers have found is, you know, you talked about the manufacturing process and wearing the clothing and the wrist straps and all of that. They found that actually their processes are so robust that they could remove some of that ESD protection on those okay. chips and still have good yields coming off the line. So they're actually reducing the amount of protection that they have on their chipsets. Now, when we start to move towards the end user environment, 
or say the, the commercial industrial environment, the key standard that's referenced most often is the IEC 61000-4-2. And this is more of a, an end equipment or system level type of standard. Now this standard uses a higher charge capacitor and a lower discharge resistor. So the overall energy is gonna be greater. Not to mention the test levels get as high as 8 kV contact and 15 kV. Yeah. So this is obviously a much more severe test than you have in the human body model in the manufacturing environment. And then there's other industries have their own standards, say like automotive. They generally go by the ISO 10605 standard, which bumps this up even more. They, breaks it down into two categories. So there's the interior category and the exterior. And the interior uses an even larger charge capacitor, so that leads to higher energy, and they test up to 15 kV contact. Uh, and the exterior goes as high as 25 kV. So really kind of the point of this, or, or the key takeaway from this, is just because, say, a chipset or something has ESD protection on it, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be robust enough to handle those end-user type of environments. So this leads to the need for some additional onboard type of protection to help, you know, max up or get that immunity towards those higher standards. Right, and then I assume as you're designing for that in your in in your system, that you're then sending that board, the finished completed product to a test house to actually get you those certifications and verify that you really are, um, you know, protected up to 15 kilovolts volts or whatever it might be. Is, is that the proper kind of flow for an engineer? Yeah, that, that's correct. That's correct. So, you know, once you have an understanding of kind of what the environment's going to be and maybe the sensitivity of, of, you know, your circuit that you're trying to protect, you, know, you lay out your board, you lay down your components, and then you can send it to a third party test house that can do testing to the IEC standard or even the automotive ISO standard or whatever other. But the IEC standard is certainly the most common in the industry that's used. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, as I've, I've done designs and, and added protection into my circuitry in the past, one of the, the critical factors that I'm looking at is the dynamic resistance um, of the different protection circuits that I'm putting in there. Uh, and, and that's one of the areas that I also see big differences between different product families, different suppliers, where the dynamic resistance can be a really big factor. So talk to me a little bit about dynamic resistance. You know, what exactly is it and why should we be considering it in our designs? Yeah, dynamic resistance is really important. It's, it's actually probably the most critical parameter in describing how well a device is going to protect or, you know, how well right. it's going to clamp. So, you know, ideally what we want is we want a component that is infinite resistance during normal operation. So there's no loss, there's no leakage. And then we want it to be zero resistance during a transient event. So all of that current energy is being dissipated within the suppressor itself. Well, obviously, we don't right. live in an ideal world. But what we want to do is try to maximize that amount of dissipation within the suppressor. And this is really directly related to dynamic resistance. So dynamic resistance is the resistive characteristic in the nonlinear state or during a transient event. Right. And there's ways you can calculate this or determine it. If you look at a VI curve, say of a typical nonlinear component, and you take two points along that VI curve, you can calculate dynamic resistance by taking the difference in the voltage and dividing that by the difference in current. And that will give you a dynamic resistance value. Now, really the, the, the main point or the key for this type of parameter is a comparison between different technologies, uh, different suppliers and everything else. It's really the best way to determine when you're doing trying to select a component, which one's gonna provide the best level of protection. So the lower the dynamic resistance, the lower uh, the clamping performance, and the better protection you're going to get overall. Now, I have to warn, as you're looking at dynamic resistance on data sheets, that you're comparing apples to apples. Because there's, there's a couple of different ways that it's derived, and it has to do with the waveform that is used to develop the, the resistive characteristic. Right. And the two most common are the 8 by 20 microsecond waveform, and that's based on a standard lightning waveform transient. And the other is a TLP pulse. And a TLP pulse is essentially a method of determining a device's or measuring the characteristics under a similar ESD event without actually applying an ESD event. Because the ESD event is really hard to, to try to capture and record, whereas a TLP is a much easier process. So we can really, you know, plot out a, T, uh, uh, a VI curve using the TLP. 
The difference is TLP is only 100 nanoseconds versus 20 microseconds. Right. So because the 20 microsecond is much longer, it's actually causing some health self-heating of the component, which causes the resistance go up. So your dynamic resistance is actually going to be higher okay. than it would be using a TLP pulse that uses a much shorter duration. So when you're looking at the characteristic and you're comparing components, make sure you're looking at TLP versus TLP or you know, 8x20 versus 8x20. Most suppliers these days will provide the TLP characteristic, but it's important that you're looking at that and comparing it accurately. Good point, good point, and, and always a little bit of uh, marketing specsmanship that can go on in data sheets. Yeah, there's, there's always uh, that. So it's always key to look into the details. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then in a battery system, you know, where the life of the battery is trying to be maximized, the current consumption of the overall system is trying to be minimized uh, to ensure that you're getting the maximum out of that battery or, or any, any system where power consumption needs to be lowered to the, the, the very lowest possible amount. Does dynamic resistance, does that play any factor in that? Is that something that engineers should be considering there? Uh, dynamic resistance is really primarily a characteristic for a transient event. Under normal right. operating conditions or standard operating conditions, the key parameter there is really going to be leakage current. So you want to make right. sure that you're maintaining as low of a leakage current as possible. And again, it kind of depends on the parameters. And you know, there's there's different common components out there that are used for ESD protection, and they all have kind of different levels of, of leakage currents. Um, so, for instance, a ceramic-based multilayer barrister is probably going to be in the range of you know several or tens of microamps. Uh, most TVS diodes or diode arrays are going to be less than a microamp or less than 100 nanoamps. And then there's other devices that are polymer-based that actually can be less than, than even a nanoamp. So, you know, if, if, you know, power consumption, power dissipation, um, you know, is of key concern, then that's the parameter you want to take a look at and make sure that, you know, it fits in with your overall scheme of the application. Perfect, perfect. And then, so... What, what are some of the things that you see design engineers forgetting when it comes to ESD on a regular basis? Are, are there any common mistakes or common issues that often get uh, overlooked? Um, you know, I, I think the first one is is they, they need to consider it early in their designs. Uh, you know, I, I've run into a lot of situations where, you know, like you've said, they've, they've built up their board, they take a ESD test, and they're failing. And now they have to figure out how they're going to mitigate this or be able to deal with this. And, you know, it, it's more difficult to try to shoehorn, I would say, you know, a component or a solution into some in a board layout that's already been done or you end up having to do a board spin and things like that. So I would say probably one of the most common things I've run into is it's, it really is something you need to consider early on in the, in the design. You know, as you start looking at laying out, you know, you always have your core components that you're going to look at first. But then as you right. start looking at the peripheral components and especially as you start looking at the uh, the entry ports and things like that in a design, that's when you really need to start considering an ESD device and what that solution needs to be. And, and to make sure that then when you eventually go to, you know, compliance and ESD testing, you're going to be in a much better position and you'll be much quicker to market. So. Right. I think it's a great point. I, I think, you know, when we get a new design as engineers, we get excited about the, the microcontroller. We get excited about the sensors, the wireless radio. We get excited about all those parts that are going to actually be doing uh, the application that we're trying to design around. And so we, we focus there um, in, in a little bit of foresight and, and, and early thinking on that protection circuitry can really save us a lot of costs, I think, down the road and a lot of design time and, and, and respin time as well. Uh, you know, as kind of part of that, you know, following up on that, that idea, how does the layout of our boards factor into that? You know, placement of parts, uh, traces, ground planes, things along those lines. What are some of the best practices with that when it comes to EST protection? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that is that re really is important and it really is a key factor. You know, you, you can go through the best process and select the best component um, for your application, but it, it's not just the component. It is how you lay it out on the board that can have a pretty major effect on how well it's going to protect or how it's going to perform under an ESD event. And a lot of this really comes down to trace inductances. So, you know, for instance, uh, an ESD event is a very fast rise event. So it's, you know, less than a nanosecond. And if you have a trace that's running from, say, your I.O. line to your suppressor, and then you've got a line running from the suppressor to your ground plane, uh, 
you know, any inductance in that because of the fast rise time is going to result in a inductive voltage drop, which then is going to add on to the voltage level that your suppressor is supplying. And that's really due to the LDIDT characteristic of that trace. Another thing is, is the trace that runs from where you connect the suppressor to the I.O. line and then where that I.O. line then eventually connects to your IC or the rest of your circuit, that can also kind of act as a buffer inductance. So under a fast rise time, you'll have a voltage drop across that portion, which can actually reduce the amount of, of voltage you would see at the end of the, at the IC. Right. So the, tra- the, the stub trace inductance really has more of an effect, so that's really the more critical of the two. But the overall idea here is really just try to place that suppressor as close to the input port or the source of the ESD event as possible, right. and that will help optimize your protect- protection and really provide the best level of protection for your circuit. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that's something, again, that kind of comes with experience. I don't know that we're always talking about that uh, right out of college. It's something that we've kind of got to learn over time. And, and that kind of expertise is is something that's important that we all have. Uh, Mark, I, thank you so much for the conversation and the time here. Uh, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, if you are an engineer that's looking for help with your designs, looking to, for at ESD and, and wanting to talk to experts like Mark, we at Future Electronics would love to have those conversations with you, with our engineering staff all over the world, um, and make introductions to people like Mark uh, to make sure that you're getting the very best recommendations for your designs. Please reach out to us at Shaping the Future at FutureElectronics.com. Again, Shaping the Future at FutureElectronics.com. We'd absolutely love to talk to you about your designs and help out. Mark, with Little Fuse, thank you so much for your time, uh, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Todd. I really appreciate it.